Good afternoon or morning, everyone, depending on where you are. Um, it is so great to be able to be back. Um, thank you, Rebecca, um, for the opportunity. Um, Rebecca, do you want to give any any introduction about this second webinar? Or would you like me to just kind of start rolling? I'm going to leave that with you. I just wanted to very quickly again add my welcome to um, to Anne. We're glad that you're able to join us for this, and we look forward to like last time, an engaging and informative session. Um, the only thing I'd like to add though, is before we sort of get into the pr presentation, we encourage you to actively engage throughout the session by sharing your comments and questions in the chat. We will have a dedicated time at the end of the presentation that Dr. Net Netler will address, but if you do have questions that come up during the course of the conversation, please do feel free to add them to the chat. And I believe that's everything. And without further delay, I am thrilled to hand over the virtual reins to Dr. Netler. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, like she said, my name is um, Dr. Ann Nettler. Ann is just fine. Um, I am the um, Vice President of Consulting with Grackle Docs, and we are presenting this webinar in partnership with GovStack. Um, so very, um, very happy to be here. I'm in the process of sharing my screen right now. And then we'll get started. So as people are um, coming in, there we go. Um, and so, and like Rebecca said, if you have questions or you wanna type them in the chat so you don't forget them, please do. Um, and then there'll be a time at the end. This webinar is about demystifying digital access. Um, what are some small changes that we can make that make a big impact? Because digital access as a whole can be something that especially when it's not our purview, especially when it's not something that we have a background in, it can be overwhelming. Um, and so those are the things we're gonna talk about today. Um, I wanna give just a really quick overview from last our last webinar, just in case you weren't able to join us. Um, and some of the salient points from that webinar are really how are we creating a WIRED, is an um, acronym that I like to use, um, welcoming, inclusive, respectful, engaging, and diverse environment um, in all the spaces where we work, in the spaces where we do business, um, the spaces where we communicate. Um, we remember that disability rights are civil rights in the U.S., and they are human rights everywhere. Um, when we create and deliver accessible materials, presentations, websites, app content, documents, emails, we have the opportunity to break down systemic barriers of things like ableism and able-bodied privilege, things that have put barriers up in front of individuals who have print-related disabilities and also in front of individuals who simply need to access content differently. Um, this lets us make sure everyone has the same opportunity everyone gets the same information at the same quality level. Um, everyone is able to meaningfully engage. Um, we increase our participation and we are not just creating a seat at the table um, for everyone. We are making sure that everyone has a microphone and that goes back to that meaningful engagement. Um, and as um, a little segue, there are currently 62 different countries and regions that have laws or policies regarding digital accessibility. And as of this past Friday, this past Monday, April 8th, 2024, um, the United States has an updated digital accessibility standard. And I would be remiss if I did not talk about it simply because it is fresh off the presses. Um, it was signed on Monday and it is a final rule that updates Title II, which is of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which covers areas of public accommodation. Um, and it is specifically to ensure the accessibility of web content and mobile applications for people with disabilities. Um, now, public accommodations are really US federal and state governments and agencies. Um, that is a very wide group of organizations um, because it also includes public school districts, public colleges and universities, public libraries, government funded agencies, um, organizations that are fulfilling government contracts. Um, if it has to do with anything digital, we'll have to be meeting this for the product that they create. Um, and what does it cover? It covers 
main websites, subsidiary sites, pretty much every website that is online, um, web-based processes. So if someone, if there's a, an interactive form or a way someone registers for things, um, a process that goes through, even if it's a third-party um, software, a third-party owned online process, um, the entity that requires the process is still responsible to make sure that process is accessible. Um, it covers all online web content. Um, now that includes documents, videos, forms. Um, it, could, it includes, like imagine for education, how many online courses there are. That number just blows my mind. Um, apps that are used by an organization, even if they are produced and maintained by a third party, the organization, if it is government funded, still has to make sure that the app itself and the content is accessible. Um, and there's a two to three year time frame on this. Um, so based on the size of the local government agency, um, depends on how much time that agency would have to be in compliance. And this compliance goes back to the web content accessibility guidelines, um, version 2.1. Um, now 2.2 is out, but it is very, very similar to 2.1. There haven't been that many changes. Um, and it follows it in its entirety. It does not pick and choose. Um, so two to three years to be in compliance, meaning all of those things have to be accessible if it is active content at the end of that two or three year time frame. Um, so brand new, um, literally hot off the presses, such important legislation. Um, when it came through, it's been widely um, and long awaited, um, but it is here. And as soon as, um, I think it's probably already there, but if it needs to be published again in a certain um, repository, um, but the final rule was signed last Monday. Um, so I'm gonna jump into our content now, but I just felt that it would be doing you a disservice not to mention that update. Um, today, I'd like to talk about some common misconceptions when it comes to digital access. Um, and then I wanna take some time and really show small changes in practice. Um, we're going to look at text and color using images, web and document layouts, multimedia, um, and using hyperlinks. Um, and then we'll have like a wrap up and key takeaway, and then there'll be time for questions. Um, so just to recap, digital accessibility refers to the inclusion, the inclusionary practice, the inclusive practice, my apologies, of removing barriers that prevent interaction with or access to websites, digital tools and technologies by people with disabilities. Um, now I've been in the field for a little over 17 years now um, and some common myths or uh, misconceptions that I have heard um, are things like creating accessible digital content is too hard. Um, I won't be able to do it. I don't have time to invest in creating all this content. It's going to be too time consuming and it's too difficult. Um, accessible content has to be plain text. Um, it can't be, it can't be, I can't have images. I can't have this. I can't have that. It's just, just plain text. Also not true. Um, accessible content cannot be engaging or it won't be engaging. Uh, well, that's an easy um, thought to have if our thought is also that it has to be plain text, that it can't have um, any images or any links or moving content or videos or engaging forms, um, that making things accessible only affects people who are blind. Um, and if you were with us at our last webinar, we talked about all the different types of individuals who benefit from having accessible digital content, not only individuals with um, who are blind or visually impaired, individuals with hearing impairments or who are deaf, um, individuals who have learning disabilities, attentional disorders, anything that affects how they read or process text. That could be a psychological impairment. It could be a chronic pain condition. There are so many different things, as well as individuals who are using older outdated technology, those who may not have the most, uh, the most um, high-end web connection, if you will, the fastest broadband, um, those who are not as tech savvy, those who are in a different location when they're accessing content. So this reaches millions and millions of people. And then the last one, I would need an IT degree to make something 
accessible. All of these are incorrect um, assumptions, um, but I hear it all the time. Um, so the key accessibility areas that we're gonna talk about, like I said, text and color, images, layout, multimedia, and hyperlinks. These are just some of the heavy hitters, right? Because if we're looking for small things that make big impact, we want to find those things that we can make just a few changes and it gives us the biggest return on our time. Um, that's a great way to get started. So text and color. Um, not all of us um, see the colors of the rainbow, for example, um, the same way. Um, actually, in this world, 9% of all men are considered colorblind. Um, and now colorblind, um, many people think that that means that that person you know, only sees in black and white. Um, that's not true, generally speaking. Um, that means really that they have a color weakness. Um, so the way that their eyes perceive certain families of color, most often reds, blues, and greens, um, is different. So what you have in front of you um, is an example of what that could look like. So um, there's an image and it has um, four columns. The first column to the left is labeled normal vision um, and it has the words and the words are a color. So the word red is what would see what should seem to someone with normal vision to be red. Um, there's the word yellow, which again, if someone does not identify as having a color weakness, um, they should see that yellow in the standard way. Um, orange, the same, green, blue, and magenta. Um, to the right of that, the next column is an is called the L cone defect. Um, and instead of the color red, the word is still there, but it appears to my eyes um, as almost a very um, dark, burnt, um, like gray um, with some red in it. Yellow, uh, to my eyes, still looks yellow. Orange is a very light, light um, and washed out color of orange. Green is almost the same color as orange. Um, blue is lighter, but it's blue. Um, and then magenta is vibrant blue to my eyes. Um, and I always have to give the stipulation that everyone experiences their condition differently. So just because this says L cone defect and this is and this is the example that is provided doesn't mean that every single person with L cone defect would see the colors exactly like this. Um, the next one over is M cone defect. And again, we see that the colors, um, instead of what would be kind of the rainbow of colors, um, they're very muted. So red appears to be almost a burnt yellow. Yellow is the same. Orange is a very light, again, washed out orange. Green is a darker, what I would call um, burnt orange. Blue is blue. Uh, magenta also appears blue to me. And the final one um, is S cone deficiency. And we see this is very different. So on this one, um, the, the colors that are on like the red side of the spectrum are what this person sees most easily. So red here, um, I would say that it's almost like a dark fuchsia. Um, so it's, it's in the red family, but not 100% red. Yellow to my eyes appears light pink. Orange appears as a darker pink. Green appears as a bright light blue. Blue is almost an aqua color and magenta is kind of maroon. Um, so imagine that someone um, that identifies as having one of these deficiencies is reading the content um, that you create. We all create content, even if um, the content that you create is mainly emails. You create perhaps documents and you send them via email. Um, you communicate with clients or with customers or even just internally, um, you use communication systems, or maybe you're someone who works in um, marketing um, or someone who works in branding or someone who works in communications or someone who works in web design um, or social media um, oversight. Imagine that what we when we use color, not everyone perceives that color in the same way, which makes it 
very important that we use text and color to convey a meaning. So there's your first easy, easy fix. Um, instead of, if there is something that you find important, instead of just highlighting that text, for example, and making it red, highlight that text. You can make it red, but also make it bold um, or make it italicized. That way, if a person who happens to have color weakness is using, um, is looking at it, then they might be able to not be able to perceive red, but they can tell that that's italics. Similarly, if we've coded that or we've formatted it to be um, as emphasis, then someone who's using a screen reader, the screen reader does not um, necessarily state this is red text that I'm reading right now, but it will note that the text has been marked with emphasis and perhaps that means that it appears bold. Um, what's on the, also on this um, slide is another great example, I think. Um, this is an identical image, except the colors are different. There are two buttons um, and they seem to be for some type of machinery. The button on the left says running and the button on the right says stopped. Um, now on the picture to the right, the running button appears to me as being green and the stop button appears to me as being red. Um, however, on the left sided um, image, the running button and the stopped button are the same color. That's as though it was being perceived by someone with color weakness. Um, and they're about this kind of a dirty yellow, I, I would say. Um, perhaps I'm not very good at um, estimating color. Um, so imagine that those words that are on the button, running and stopped, were not there. And this is a big piece of technical equipment. What if there was an emergency and you had to stop that machine immediately? When you go to those buttons, if those words were not present in the heat of the moment, it is so easy that the wrong button would be pushed. I think that's a great example. Uh, and it also applies when we're using text. Um, so text formatting is really important, but we write the text anyway. We're not looking at doing anything different outside of the work you already do. Um, so when you're using text, uh, we want to make sure that it's as readable as possible. Um, when we think about formatting, it's the same. When we want to emphasize text, um, making it bold, making it italic, um, that is a that is perfectly fine. I always caution against underlining because underlining can make something appear to be a link when it is not, to be a hyperlink when it is not, which could be confusing to some people. Um, as opposed to you know, just using color, like I said before, put them together. Um, for the font style, um, there are certain fonts, perhaps that are your go-to fonts um, that you use all the time. Check and see if they're what's called a sans serif font. You could literally Google sans serif fonts and it will give you a huge list of them. Um, some of them are things like Arial, Calibri, Veranda. Um, there are many, many more than that. So sometimes that small change is simply switching um, from, let's say, um, I, I know that um, one of my father's favorite fonts is Comic Sans. Bless him. Um, Comic Sans is not an accessible font. Um, but if he made one small change and switched to Calibri, let's say, that's the only change he had to make. And now that document is so much more accessible or that website or that content is so much more accessible. We just changed the font. Um, we just you know, made something red and clicked bold. That's the only change we had to make. Um, and it also, affects color contrast, like we saw previously in words. Um, so the web content accessibility guidelines um, provide measures by which what ratio of color um, is seen as being acceptable. And for standard size text, that's the ratio. And it, the ratio is the background color and the foreground color. So the background color and the text color, really. Um, for standard size text, it's four and a half, four point five. 4.5, to one. Um, if it is large text, like something that you're putting on a billboard or something that's being um, projected onto a large screen from a PowerPoint or a keynote presentation, um, that contrast can be three to one. 
Now you're asking, how in the world am I going to know that that contrast is what it is? Great question. The easy small fix is download a free color contrast checker. Literally, I Googled color contrast checker. Um, there are many of them that are free. They're, all the ones that I saw are based off of WCAG, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Um, the one that I downloaded happens to be um, a Chrome add-in, um, but there's plenty other ones. And it is literally as easy as clicking on it. Then you click on the background color and you click on the color of, you click on one of the, the words that you type, like the text, and it will tell you immediately if it passes. So you don't have to guess. Um, literally, open it and click. That's it. Um, and a good rule of thumb is if you can read it um, from a further away distance, you're, you're probably pretty good. The example that I have on the screen um, has five different kinds of colors of background with five different colors of text. Um, so the first one is a green background and red text, and that fails the contrast. And even looking at it, um, you may notice that it's difficult to perceive the difference. Um, the next one is a black background with a dark gray text. Um, again, difficult to perceive. Um, then there's a dark gray background with yellow text. I would say that that's easier to perceive. And that is something that if it was a larger um, font presentation or presentation, you'd be fine. Um, the next one, which would also be fine for a large presentation, but not for smaller text, is light blue with dark blue um, letters. And the last one, which shows as a passing example, is a light yellow background with red letters. Um, and on that one, I would say that that's one of the easiest for me to read also. So sometimes you go with your gut, but there are literally free apps and software that's like an add-on. I open it, I click the colors I want to compare, and that's it. And it does all the work for me. There are also built-in accessibility checkers um, and assistive technologies that you can use to do this. So if you're making a Word document um, or a PowerPoint document or um, a PDF document, Word, PowerPoint, um, and Adobe all have built-in accessibility checkers that will help you flag things like color contrast. And it's one click. Check accessibility. That's it. That's all you have to do. It'll show you where the, any issues might be. It'll even help you understand how to fix them. Um, but that's it, one click. It's an easy fix. Just like changing my font is an easy fix. Making something both red and bold, that's an easy fix. You know, I'm, I send emails all day long. I can do that. That's something that's definitely attainable for me. The next thing we're gonna do is talk about images. Um, and there's an image on the screen and the image itself is a darker image. And I did that on purpose so that we could read what the caption is. Um, and it says leaders of the August 23rd, 1963 civil rights march in Washington, DC lead a crowd of marchers holding signs down the street. A sign reading, we demand decent housing now is prominently displayed. Um, so that's a great description of the purpose of what's going on in that image. Um, it tells us the date that that was happening. Um, it tells them, us where they are, why that's relevant to that picture, right? And then we can see what the alt text, alt text is alternative text that is actually hidden behind the image that a sighted person doesn't see. Um, but it gives us a sneak peek in this image and it shows us that the alt text, what's hidden right behind the image is that same description. So that image is gonna be accessible even for someone that cannot see it um, or for someone that doesn't have a strong broadband connection and the image won't load. They can still read the description. So um, I'm gonna walk through an example with you. So this is a customer service example. We want to connect with you, uh, we being the organization, the company. Which of the following options should we use to send you information? Um, and that's a, that's a question that, I mean, many companies want to know. What's the best way for me to send you an update, for me to send you information? 
Well, which one do you think is the best? The options are on, they're right on the screen. Option A, option B. I don't think anyone would be able to pick because what's pictured are two identically sized black boxes. Um, and I did that to show what it's like um, as a visual example for someone um, who uses screen reading technology, um, who would not be able to see those images when there is no alt text behind the image. Um, so the experience of a person who is blind or visually impaired, um, when there are images without alt text, they are not connected. Um, they don't get an opportunity to participate in that question, to answer that question for that company, That's which is actually really important to them. They want that company to communicate with them in the best way possible, but they can't perceive what's the difference between those two options. What about this? Now the pictures are visible. Um, so a sighted person would see that the picture option A um, is a set of hands holding a cell phone that's pointing towards the person. Um, and there is the text text message on that, on that option A. So option A is a text message. Option B is the image of hands typing on a laptop. And then there's a superimposed image of an envelope and um, like people icons surrounding it. And the text says email. Um, so if I'm a sighted person, I could easily pick and tell that company what's the best way to communicate with me. Now, here's the best way yet. If someone who is a screen reader user is accessing this quick survey that the company has sent them, now the difference is it's not a blank empty box. Um, the blank empty box would, the screen reader would say image and then no alt text. Now they each have alt text. So the first one is hands holding a cell phone as if to read a message with text, text message. The second one is hands typing on a laptop with an envelope and person icons superimposed on top of the text, on top with text email. So if I'm someone who's visually impaired or who is blind and I'm using a screen reader, I now can participate equally. I can engage and interact equally um, with my peers and I can make sure that my voice is now heard. So how do you do that? Um, it is actually um, far easier than you might think. Um, so if you're using um, if you're making a Word document, if you're putting it in a website, if you're putting it in a social media post, if you're putting it in a PowerPoint, um, for social media posts, there's a, usually a little bit of a different way, but it's the same premise. So here I've, in, I've put in my image, which is in this case, the text message image. I've right clicked and that window, which is pictured in the middle of the screen, um, has view alt text circled. That's what I'm going to select. I right click. I select view alt text, and that will cause a window to pop up that says alt text. And there is a box where I can just simply type in my one or two sentence description, and that's all I have to do. So the only, the small change is I put the image in just like I would have done before. I right click that image, I click view alt text, and I type like, two sentences or my, my description, which does not need to be long, shouldn't be super lengthy, but should contain the purpose of the image. Um, so in other words, we're going to think about context. So instead of, um, let's say this was the same picture, maybe the text wasn't present. Um, and, but really it was a picture showing off the new iPhone. Um, the purpose behind it at that point would be, um, you know, two hands holding um, iPhone 15 Pro X, what is it, whatever it is, um, with silver case. That's the purpose of it if it's trying to advertise an iPhone. In this case, it's trying to give the example of text message as a way to be contacted. So the alt text was hands holding a cell phone as if to read a message and then with the text, text message. That's it. A right click and one click after right click, one click. And that's it. 
It's that tiny change that makes a huge difference. You have just made that engaging and available to everyone. So layout is another um, important piece when it comes to access. Um, and the image on the screen now is of a heading structure in a paper, um, in a Word document in this example. And sometimes this kind of takes people aback uh, because they're not used to using built-in styles and using the formatting that's already present. And that is what I would tell you is the biggest secret. Use the formatting tools that are already built in to the software that you are using instead of trying to create something from scratch, which is what I did um, in this example here. Um, this is my what not to do example. This is in PowerPoint. Um, this slide template actually had space, had built in space for two visuals, for two images or for two content things. Um, and so, the ones that I put in first are, um, there's there are two dogs. Um, the image on the left is uh, my dog. His name is Henry. Um, and then the image on the right is also my dog and her name is Maggie. Um, and, but let's say I found a picture of the two of them together and I just thought it was fantastic and I wanted to include it on this slide. So there's another third image not built into the template that I just went to insert. I clicked on picture and I plopped it in there. It looks great. Um, if I was a sighted person, I could still access that. However, if I'm someone who's using reading software of any kind, not just screen reading software, that's going to affect the reading order of the slide because really we've put, it's almost like we've put a foreign object onto that slide. Um, the slide wasn't built for it which means it's not programmed. It's not gonna tell the screen reader in the right way where that image is. Um, it could move around the other reading order and it could make that entire slide very difficult for someone to understand. So how do I not do that? Um, the best way is to simply make a slide template that has three images in it. That's it. Um, and that's so easy. I, all I had to do was um, I went to view and I clicked on the slide master. Um, and most people um, have never done this before. So under view, it's there, I promise, slide master. And it's gonna open the images on the screen, which is a screen grab of PowerPoint with the slide master option open. You can create your own customized template slide that you can use over and over and over and over again. You can put in as many content holders as you want. Um, you can move them around. You can put them wherever you'd like them to be. You can put in the title box. You can decide if you want um, specific images that are branded at the bottom, um, like in this PowerPoint and in the one previously, um, I went in and I created a master slide, a whole deck of slides that all have the GovStack and Grackle icons on them um, because this is a partnership that we're doing together. And I wanted to emphasize that throughout my entire presentation. So every single slide has that on there. I did not copy and paste those onto every slide. That would have taken way too much time. I don't have time for that. I made one change, one tiny change in the slide master and it inserted it on all of the slides. Not only does that make it more accessible because I can in input the alt text for those just one time, it's done. Um, but it just made that, it took, it took time work off of my plate. You'll be surprised that when you start putting those little small changes in, it actually makes it easier to create the content. It's like the best kept secret in digital access. Um, but that's all you need to do. You go to view, slide master. You can say insert, insert slide master, which will create a whole new deck of slides that you could customize. Or you could just put one new slide in. Like, hey, I wanna have three pictures. I want my dogs 
each individual picture and then I want a combined picture. So here I am, I've made an out and I've made something that looks just right. It has the three pictures where I want them and that's it. I would close the master view. I'd go back, make sure that that's the layout that I chose. And then I can put that third picture in there and I don't have to worry about it because it's built into the process. But that's all I had to do. I just made a layout for it. Done. So this, um, and it should work with the audio. Um, this is an example of when a screen reader um, does not read um, content correctly because it hasn't been made correctly. Now, this example could be on a website. It could be in a document. Um, it could be in an email. It could be anywhere. Handout for class. This is the most important piece of failure that also will most like result in information you will receive in this failing. The class can it class make so you are ever part responsible for your lack of written fully understand it preparation for my class. So um, that didn't make any sense. And frankly, that's the point. Um, in this case, the person who created this document um, typed the content, but instead of actually making it two columns, they typed that first line, they hit tab a couple times, and then typed what they wanted to be the first line of the next column, and then so forth and so on. But since it's not formatted like real columns, the tech, the screen reader reads it as though it's one line of text and it doesn't make any sense. Okay, so here is an example where we show how to fix that and how to do it the right way. The Word document featured here contains the exact same text as the document in the previous video. That document started with what looked like a heading, handout for class. If we want to make something a heading that not just looks the part, but will be seen as a heading by screen reading software, and also when needing to load correctly in different formats, we just need to format it that way. I've highlighted the text, handout for class, and I'm gonna to go to styles. And I see that heading one is an option. There's also a heading two um, and lots of different styles I could choose from. We always wanna start a document with heading one. Um, it's thinking, thinking of it as an outline. Number one is your most important point. You might have sub points under that. Um, a sub point might be seen as a letter A. Well, perhaps that's your heading two. Um, and a point underneath that might be a small number. Perhaps that's your heading three. But we wouldn't start with a heading two. We wouldn't start with a supporting point unless we've already shared the most important piece, the heading one. Now, in this case, when I mouse over heading one, I see that it has changed my text to blue um, and it has made it larger, but I want it to look just like the, te the text in the previous document. So I'm gonna right click and choose modify. And I'm gonna tell it exactly what I want it to look like. I'm gonna choose bold, black text, and centered. And I'm gonna click okay. And now all I need to do is choose heading one and that text handout for class is centered, bold, and in large font at the top of my page. It looks exactly the same as it did in the video. However, now it not only looks the part, but it's a true heading. How about those columns? I'm gonna highlight this text and then I'm going to go up to layout. I'm gonna choose columns and two. It's as easy as that. In the previous document, whoever typed that message, typed the text and then chose when to hit tab, typed different text, and then went throughout the document in that way. 
that probably took a lot of time. In this case, it was one click. Now this document is formatted properly and will read cleanly by any screen reader. Handout for class. This is the most important piece of information you will receive in this class. Make sure you read every part of it and fully understand it. Failure to do so will most likely result in you failing the class. I cannot be responsible for your lack of preparation for my class. So that, I think, gives us a perfect example of an easy change. We used the column feature, we used that heading one, and for those who might have thought before, hey, it can't be engaging, I can't make it look like I still want it to look. You absolutely can. You can modify what those pre-built in structural elements look like. You can modify it to your brand colors. You can modify it to your company's chosen font. Let's hope it's a sans serif font. You can make it look however you want it to look and that's okay. It will still be the right heading one electronically. Um, and here's an example of those same things, but on a website. So this is um, one of the websites through Grackle's site, um, www.grackle.com uh, or gracklecom um, And here we have a heading one. That's that digital accessibility services and products from Grackle Docs. That's the most important point. We have a heading two. The, the right tools to make digital accessibility easy. That's a sub point. We've got another heading to at the bottom of the page. So here's another supporting point, our suite of digital accessibility tools. Um, and we can even see that the image that's on the screen above it, um, we, it has alt text. The alt text is a group smiling during a business meeting and it's listed right there. So how do I know that that's in here? I've used the free WAVE accessibility evaluation tool, free. It's a an add-on that you can add to Google, um, but you can also get access to it different ways. And it's not the only one, but it's pretty widely used. Um, and this is, again, we're making a small change. If you wanted to check a lot of websites and you wanted to go deeper than WAVE can, you could absolutely have an audit done um, like a web audit, um, an app audit, a software audit um, that would be more comprehensive. But again, right now we're talking about demystifying access. Um, so all I did, I clicked the icon for WAVE on my computer and I clicked on structure. That's it. Um, and it shows me the structure so I can make sure it's right. And I can look right on the website because it highlights it for me. It did all of that for me. I didn't do any of that, but it let me double check. Hyperlinks, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, so imagine that I have a link that I want someone to access. Um, and I think it's really important. That link might be online. It might be in an app. It might be a document. Um, so what's on the screen are examples of ways that I could present that link. The first says, use this link. And then it literally has the entire URL for the link. It's, gosh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 lines long of letters and numbers. And a screen reader will attempt to read all of it. Um, and then at the very end of it, it says to watch the video. That is not going to make sense. And frankly, it's probably not going to make a whole lot of sense to a sighted user either, especially a sighted user who learns differently. Um, now, the next option is we see the text click here and it's a link. It's underlined for the video. Um, that's not especially clear, is it? Um, I don't know what the video is. I don't know where it's gonna take me if I click here um, because the text itself, click here, doesn't tell me anything. It just gives me the command. Um, and so if I don't know where it's gonna take me, I'm probably not gonna click on it. And especially if I don't know what the video even is, I don't know that I wanna watch a random video from some link. Um, the, the third one is the most appropriate one. So what it says is our website features an ADA training video 
that we highly recommend. The text ADA training video is the hyperlink. So literally that hyperlink tells me exactly where it's gonna take me. It's gonna take me to the ADA training video. Simple as that. And it's the sentence tells me it's highly recommended, tells me it's their website that it's taking me to. I understand that. If I'm someone who learns differently, whose brain simply works differently, if I'm using screen reading software or reading software, I understand that. I can use it and I can use it and get everything out of it just like everybody else. Now, how do you do that? So all that you would have to do when you type that sentence, you would highlight the text that you want to make the link. So the text that best describes where the link will take you. In this case, that text is ADA training video. So I highlighted the text, I right clicked, and I chose link. And then this window is what pops up. It's an edit hyperlink window. And this is in you know, most Windows-based um, or Microsoft-based programs. Um, and then there's a place for address. I type or I paste really that big long URL right there. And all I do is click OK. And then once I've done that, I get this bottom example. ADA training video is now the link. It has that big long URL tucked in, in there right behind it. And now it makes sense. So all I did was right click and choose link. And then I pasted that big URL in. That's it. And this also looks so much more professional put together. Um, it's just better all the way around. Um, we did that one. So um, wrapping up, some things to remember. And I also wanted to make a mention of multimedia. I had several multimedia examples that we saw today. Important in there. Um, they were captioned. They were captioned accurately. So that means that the captions were edited, um, edited for spelling, for punctuation. Um, they were edited to show if there was more than one speaker who was speaking. Um, and you know what? I created that second video myself, the one where there's a Word document and um, we showed how we made the columns. I created it myself. Um, to do that captioning, the video is, I think, three minutes and change long. Um, to, to finish it all up with the captioning took me an extra maybe four minutes. You know why? Um, because when I made that video, I used a software that will auto caption for me. Um, Teams, Microsoft Teams, which is free, does that for you. Zoom will do that. Um, let's see, Kaltura will do that. Um, there's lots of different softwares that will do that. And it auto captions it. So all I did was I, I recorded myself in a Teams meeting where I was the only one present. Um, I clicked on the link that it gave me automatically. It opens it up. Um, I think it opens it up in Stream if you're uh, Microsoft um, familiar. And then I could just, I clicked on um, captions. I could tell it to auto caption. It took maybe a minute or two and it captioned everything. Now, was it all accurate? No, but it only took me three minutes to go through the transcript that it shows me right on the screen, easily make just a few edits because it, it was pretty good. Um, it only had very minor mistakes because that software has come a long way. And then I was done. I had a fully captioned video. It took me the entirety to record it, three minutes and change, and then another three minutes to make sure that the captioning met standards. That's it, it took me six minutes to do that entire thing. Um, but that's important. You also wanna make sure that whatever we're using to play the video is also accessible. Um, is it something that we can tab through the buttons and it works? We can find the buttons. Um, and something like that is something that's a great to find things like that if they're web-based. Um, you could use a screen reader to check it. Uh, you could have an audit. Um, there's a lot of different ways to check that. But to make that video, it was six minutes. That's it. Um, some other things. 
proactive versus reactive, making sure we have videos with the pro appropriate text and best practice when you're showing a video as part of a presentation, or even you could choose to do this if there's a video that auto plays on your website, one, make sure that it's possible to turn that video off. Um, or if it's a video that plays, like once you click play, um, have the captions show automatically. Um, when you're doing a presentation somewhere, have the captions show automatically. Um, making sure that there's descriptive text, we talked about that. Um, making sure that if, if you can tab through the content there's a and it, and it goes in order, there is a better chance that a screen reader will be able to do the same thing and understand it. Um, make sure there's an audio and a visual option. So just like we had um, the video, there was a text, there were captions, and I could generate a transcript. If it was something that was audio only, I'd want to make sure there was a transcript. If there was something that was visual only, like let's say it was a video, but there was no sound, it was just um, motion and things happening, I'd want to make sure that there is an audio, audio, audio description of what was happening. That way, if someone um, does not see or they can't load the video in full, they can hear the description and not miss anything. They're not excluded. Um, think about ways that these tiny changes could affect your emails, uh, maybe policies that you already have. How could we update policies? Think about vendor policies. How might that make a difference? Forms, handouts. Um, when we think about apps and third-party software. Think about the content that you create, perhaps, and send to be included in your app. Think about what's already there. How? What are things that now that you know these things, might it be important to have someone check to make sure that they're accessible? Um, some takeaways and things to remember. Use the formatting features that are built into Word, PowerPoint, Excel, um, PDF, et cetera. Use, oh, here's a good one. Use proper numbered lists. So instead of typing one and then typing your information and then two and typing your information, under um, the home tab, just click the button that has the numbered list on it. And then it does it for you and it's accessible. Uh, we talked about thinking about the hierarchy in formatting like an outline, heading one, heading two, heading three. Um, remember that an accessibility checker that's built in is so helpful, but not 100% perfect. Um, there's always a need to kind of put a pair of eyes um, on it. We're going to use color and emphasis together appropriately. We want to make clear hyperlinks. Um, we're going to ensure that videos have appropriate captions. Again, that one took me six minutes. Um, and just be aware that there are companies and software available to check and update accessibility in documents, websites, and many other digital platforms, and also to give guidance on where you might want to look. Um, I know that GovStack can put resources in your hands. Grackle Docs um, also is one of those, can be one of those resources. So some questions to ask yourself when you're going through your content, whether it's an email or something you're putting online. Is everything laid out in a way that makes sense? Will the images or pictures be beneficial for someone who accesses content differently? Meaning, did I remember to put the alt text in? Um, can I use hyperlinks the right way? Do they make sense? Can I download it to my computer? And if so, what does it look like once it's downloaded? If it's garbled or moved around, that means that I haven't used the right formatting, most likely. Does the video have captions? Are they accurate? Um, and then can someone navigate this content with a screen reader? If you've been checking all those boxes, um, the accessibility of what you are creating has increased a hundredfold. And so now um, we'll open up for questions. I wanted to pat, put up that last slide though, because this is a three-part webinar series. And our third one is addressing barriers, ensuring consistency and creating a strategic access plan. And that's May 13th, um, 2024 at 1 p.m. Eastern time. So a little plug for that. Um, and then I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing and come right back. Are there any questions?
we do have some questions and I will throw them up on the screen. Let me know if you're able to see them and then we can sort of take them in order. We'll start with this one. Sure. Um, so I've learned that headings should be left just left justified. Is it okay to center headings as long as styles are used? Yes. As long as you're using, as long as you're formatting it as a heading, it can be something that can be centered on a page. Um, you want to make sure that you build that into the formatting. So just like I did when I went to that heading one, I right clicked and I built it in. That's fine. Um, making it yourself without formatting is a problem no matter what. Um, but it, I checked what I did. I literally checked it with a screen reader and it identified it as a heading and it was fine. Okay, moving on to the next one. Uh, oh, sorry. That's the same one. <laughs> Bear with me a second. Here we go. How does a screen reader read a hyperlink hidden within text? Um, so it can identify that there is a link present um, because what really happens when we put in a hyperlink, we're inserting a link into the digital backdoor content. Um, so when the screen reader is reading through, it can tell the difference between standard type text and a hyperlink. So it will literally say, depending on how you have your screen reader settings, um, link, and then it will read the text. So that, that user, that person knows that text is a hyperlink and it can and that person can then use their own keyboard commands and select the link and hit enter um, so they know exactly what it is and it actually makes more sense because the text explains where the link is going to take them as opposed to getting just the link which is the entire url that's incredibly confusing um, it sounds ridiculous in a screen reader um, so it, but it can, it can, it can differentiate between standard typed text and text that is link, that is link text because in behind the scenes, it's tagged differently. Great question. Um, how do I know if your auto caption caption is following captioning rules such as starting a new caption for a new sentence and or staying within the readable caption character limit? Um, how do I know if you're auto caption? Okay. Um, so when you use whatever software you use to make your video, um, so the example I gave was I used Microsoft Teams, but I could have used um, Zoom or anything else. Um, when I go into that video and I click on captions on my end as the creator of the video, I can see the transcript, but it's not just the full transcript. It breaks it up into um, like the little each caption. So it shows what the caption will look like on the screen. And then I can change, um, like if, I, if something is starting mid-sentence, um, it's going to auto caption it the way that it thinks it will start with the sentence starting, you know, that next sentence starting on the, the new caption. If I need to change something where perhaps it didn't do it right and it's really not the beginning of a sentence, that's actually the middle of a sentence. Um, I can fix it editorially really fast and I can change where that text appears. Um, so it, instead of it's just big, like one big paragraph of text, it breaks it down by timeline. So I can go in and I can make all those changes and it's really easy. Good question. Mm -hmm. Moving on. Ah, what is the guidance for use of all caps in PDF form? Um, there's a lot of different op opinions about that. Generally, um, all caps can be seen as like um, shouting or providing additional emphasis. I would use other things to provide emphasis. So if you would use all caps to put provide emphasis, I might make the, I might use standard text. Um, so like case text and make an, and format it as bold and maybe add a color if I want to do two different things. Um, when that is the purpose of the text, uh, because caps is another thing that the screen reader, a screen reader may not um, recognize that it's all caps. So it might read it as um, like literally if the text all and caps were in all caps, like it's typed um, in this question, it might read A-L-L-C-A-P-S because it's all um, capitalized letters. 
Um, or it might read it all together, but it still doesn't put any emphasis on it. Um, so I would say use a different kind of emphasis. You make it bold and italics, um, add a color, do all, you know, do all three together, um, because usually that's going to convey the same importance that the all caps would have done, but in a way that's accessible. What is the re recommendation for formatting of dates so they are properly read by screen readers? Um, so that is a question that also is dependent upon um, which country you live in, uh, because in some countries it is more recognized um, to say the number day first and then the month and then the year. And in other countries, um, it's more common to say the month, the date and the year. Um, listing it out, listing it straight um, and saying like today is April and then 15 with a comma and then 2024 is appropriate. Um, if you are um, making something and you're just putting the day, so like saying April, April 15th, but not the 2024, um, I might make sure that I put the TH next to the 15th so that it's read that way. Um, but that's a really contingent uh, because if you're from a different country um, where like in Europe, it's much more common um, and in Asia, many countries, it's much more common to say um, 15th April 2024. Um, and if that's what your screen reader is looking for, it depends on the settings within the screen reader for the country. Um, so it's not necessarily a hard and fast. Um, thoughts about infographics. Um, I like that they're not... I feel like they're not a great idea, but how would you handle them if you have to use one? Got it. Um, so infographic, um, it's um, sometimes people will call them um, GIFs, um, where it's this tiny um, video and it kind of plays on loop. Um, you get them from different sources, um, or it could be um, an image that has text in it, but the, it's not text itself. Um, you want to make sure that you're providing alt text and descriptive text for those. Any The purpose of the information that's within it needs to be provided in alt text. Um, you're right. They're not the best idea. So if you can avoid them, avoid them. Um, however, if you have to use it, make sure that there is good alt text behind it um, that makes it clear or even that there's, you know, even caption like on the screen, if you will, um, to read what it says. Um, and remember that if it's a picture with text in it, you still need to add alt text uh, because the screen reader is not gonna be able to read the text that's within the image. Um, so making sure that, that those things have really good descriptive text. This one, I believe somebody in the audience was kind enough to answer it, but I thought maybe you'd like to add some context. Or Great question. Can decorative images have alt text? If it is decorative, when you click on the image, when you right click on it, just like we did in the example, um, and you choose view alt text, there is a box that says mark as decorative or mark as background, depending on which program you're using. Um, if it is just decorative, I would click that box, mark it as background. Um, if you don't feel like, if, if you feel like there's a need to put alt text, then maybe it's not decorative. Um, if, if the image adds information or content or adds clarity, you feel, um, to what you are presenting, then it, it might not be decorative. Um, if it's something that's like stylistic, like, you know, lines that are used on a page to make, to break up sections, but um, you know, they're, they're just images, they're not actually formatted in any way, I would mark them as decorative because that way the screen reader or reading software knows to skip them, um, knows that they just it just ignores it. It just goes over it. Background decorative. Um, so if you have something where you'd like, hey, um, I really want to put alt text here, then it's probably not decorative. So you can put alt text. But if it is a decorative image, just click that box. You find that box in the same place where you would have typed those one or two sentences of your alt text. Just a couple more. Mm -hmm. Let's see, I've heard you mention the use of italics formatting a few times now, but I thought this was discouraged because it may be difficult for some 
sighted people with other types of disabilities to read? Can you clarify? Um, no, italics can be used. I think the difference there is um, make sure that the font you are using is a sans serif font. If it's a sans serif font, then when it's made italics, um, it is still easier to read. Um, you also want to think about the size of your text. If the text is very small, italicizing it might not be the best idea. Maybe you want to make it bold instead, um, thinking about readability. If it's something that's going to be larger text, something that's presented, having it be italics as long as you're using a sans serif font is okay. Um, it's actually better than making it underlined because underlined text um, often resembles a hyperlink. And so for someone who may have visual impairment or just simply their brain um, accesses print content differently, um, they might click on that and then it might be confusing because nothing happens. Um, but italics, generally it's making sure you have a sans serif font. Um, and then, you know, obviously you're gonna use your better judgment if you have text that's like, you know, size 10, size eight. First of all, I would say we need bigger text um, to make it accessible. Um, that, that that's where you would kind of, you know, think through. Um, but as long as it's the right kind of font, then you should be fine. And I believe this is our final one. Um, let's see, is use of all caps not recommended in the wording of logos? Understanding we can use alt text, but what about ease of reading for people with, with no vision issues? Um, I mean, that's a stylistic thing. If you're, when you're not talking to me, obviously you can put something in a, um, in, in, in a alt text. But, um, again, um, if it's a stylistic choice because you're going to provide the accessible way you're, you're providing a reasonable, accessible way to access the same content, um, which so you're providing an alternate means of accessing the content, which would still be accessible, um, especially because it's an image. So for readability, um, I would always look at what is the color contrast if you're using um, all caps? Um, is it still readable? Um, is the color contrast still appropriate? Um, that's a big deal in terms of individuals with, um, who don't have a vision issue, but may have other issues as well. Um, um, but it's really stylistic. So um, as long as you're providing a reasonable and accessible, um, like an equal a way to get that same equal information. So in that case, it would be the alt text, um, then, then you're okay. Um, but you do want to think about, you know, is there a way, like, what does it look like? Um, does it, does it meet the size requirements for the color contrast? What, what else is going on? What's the font that's being used? Is the font that's in the logo a sans serif font? Um, or is it a different kind of font that's maybe more stylistic? This one seems to come on the heels of the other one. So I thought I'd just throw it in there. Um, so I thought all caps slows down reading speed for sighted readers. It certainly can um, because it's not the standard case text that, you know, any person is used to looking at. So it certainly can slow down a reading speed, um, which isn't helpful. Um, we all create content that we want everyone to be able to use to the greatest extent possible. Um, so that is another another reason not to use it um, and to use a different types, type of emphasis, formatted emphasis instead. And it seems appropriate to end on this comment right here. So I will thank you, Andrew. <laughs> I think we can all concur. Um, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Anne, for an incredibly informative uh, jam-packed session. We, I, I certainly appreciate it. And I'm, I'm fairly certain based on the comments that everyone else feels the same way. So um, again, we, we, we thank you for, for, for joining us. We hope that you'll join us for the final session. Um, as Anne pointed out, it will be on May 13th. We will be sending information out for that one. Um, and thank you for your questions. Uh, they were great and, and uh, helped a lot of us. It certainly answered some questions for me. So thank you for that. Um, and with that said, thank you again. Have a great rest of your day and we hope to see you in May. Yeah, thanks everyone so much.